Have Skinwalkers Migrated? Part 2 of 2 By Redditor Sky Mary Hathaway The way back to my parents' house was through back roads in the county, which means they were long, curvy, heavily wooded, and more than one creek winding through them. Most of the creeks didn't have guardrails since the roads weren't used as much as they would be in a city or town. The roads were easy to navigate in the day, but since the sun was setting quickly, I knew we had to get to the house as quickly as possible. I tried everything to distract myself from the creatures running beside my truck. I looked over at Max and she was sound asleep, not even noticing them. Somehow, I couldn't keep my eyes off of them. I tried as hard as I could to focus on the road and my surroundings, I tried to focus on how pretty the leaves looked during the fall. I thought of my family and friends, I thought of all my wonderful co-workers who did on occasion call or send me flowers for being good at my job. I looked at all the streams and creeks I was passing and admiring how beautiful they looked. I listened to the radio playing all my favorite oldies and sang along to them. Still, my eyes drifted. They weren't slowing down, they didn't seem tired. These creatures were still weaving in and out of the tree line staring me down. I couldn't quite look at them long enough to figure out what they were, but they were some sort of dog-like creature. Yet, as I was driving they seemed to be quiet. They didn't scream or do weird noises like I heard the night before. They almost seemed to be waiting for... something. The sun was setting even faster, it was slowly getting darker and darker. Luckily, I had amazing headlights to light up the road in front of my pretty well. But still, the part of the county we were in had a two-lane road that was small. Only one yellow line distinguished which side of the road you were on. Since I had a heavy-duty truck I had to ride in the middle so I wouldn't send my truck nor my camper into the ditch. I continued to drive behind my dad, occasionally looking to see how far ahead he was. He didn't travel faster than the speed limit, but this time he was 30 yards ahead of me. I sped up to keep close behind. I was slowly catching up when we passed over one of the deeper creeks. Bam. Splash. Something had hit the side of my truck hard enough to flip it off the road. I must have been unconscious for hours. When I came to, I woke up with someone flashing a light in my eyes. I could see their mouths moving but all I could hear was a deep ringing. Everything seemed fuzzy and I drifted between conscious and unconsciousness. The last thing I remember was getting loaded onto the ambulance and seeing my truck and camper in literary pieces. I couldn't see the Max at first. But when I did, I noticed she was 10 feet up into a tree and shredded to pieces. I don't remember much but I do remember I had been transported to a hospital near a decent sized city and I had been in a coma for only a couple days when I finally woke up. I woke up in the middle of the night when a nurse came to check on me. When she opened the door and saw I was awake she ran out in a panic. It must have been a good 10 minutes when she and a man came walking in. Hey, you're going to be fine, I see you have woken up, do you know where you are? The man said. I couldn't talk. I had a fucking piece of plastic shoved down my throat. When I noticed it I started gagging and coughing. The nurse quickly grabbed something and shoved it into my fore and I was out like a light again. From what my parents told me I had to be put into a coma for three weeks to let my body heal from the accident. I eventually woke up, healed and ready to get up and go. But alas, I still had to stay for a week to let my body adjust? I don't really know. Eventually, I did get to go home to my parents. I had no truck, I had no camp trailer, and I had no Max. I still remember the shape her body was in, and I don't think anyone but me noticed. I spent most of my first day home mourning the loss of Max. I missed her so much, she didn't deserve this. I felt like all of this was my fault, and essentially it was. That night the noises started back up, the screams, the different voices, everything. I was pissed. What could they possibly want? 
They killed my dog, ruined my truck and camper and put me in a coma for weeks on end. I got up and wobbled outside. Shut up, go away, I screamed everything I possibly could to get them to go away. I walked out further into my parents' yard to confront these senile creatures. That's when I noticed, they didn't look like dogs or coyotes or wolves. They kind of did, but not fully. The back end of them was the body of a dog but the front was humanism and the head of the creature was big, fluffy and misshapen. There were at least 20 of these creatures. I quickly turned on my heel and went back inside. I could tell they were running right for me, but I couldn't run, I was still hurt. I accepted the fact that I could possibly get killed and I was fine with it. I wasn't with anyone, and my parents have multiple children. I reached the door, quickly ran and shut it and locked it all in time. I could hear the creatures throw their bodies against the house, and it felt like a never-ending earthquake shook the house to its core. I could feel them breathe. My parents came running down the stairs and grabbed me rushing me down to the basement as the back door splintered into pieces letting more and more of the evil creatures in. My dad deadbolt and hit a little red button in the basement. The sound of screeching metal filled my ears as a metal box surrounded the room. Why haven't you ever told me of this? I asked. I built it just in case my dad replied. And with that reply, he went cold. That's when I knew, this has happened before. To grandma, and as far as I know to me. I turned to my mother and I asked her. What happened? She looked at me and sighed. She knew exactly what I meant when I asked her question, which sent her into a story I have never even imagined. Back in the day, when grandma was a young teenager, her parents lived here in Tennessee, she dated a young Shawnee boy. She loved this boy to pieces. They spent every waking moment attached at the hip. Well, her daddy didn't like him too much. He thought it was unethical. Fucking racist bastard. And decided to. Well, take care of the problem. Since then the Shawnee tribe has cursed any land our family was touched. That's why she died when you were young. Different creatures of the day or night stalk us, waiting for the moment to kill us. And you called upon one of the night creatures, and now they're here dash. I could hear furniture being ripped to pieces, and the house torn apart. My heart pounded out of my chest. I was angry, I was depressed knowing what my mom was going to say next. They are here because you called them upon us again. We lived in the shadows. Until now. She stopped and turned away, I could tell that she was angry and frustrated. I felt my heart sink to my stomach. I did this. This was all my fault. It had felt like we have been in this metal imprisonment for weeks. We had enough food, and only one single flashlight. We had buckets with lids for ours. You know the business. We slept on the floor in sleeping bags and for pillows, we used our jackets. It was coyish, a little too cozy. My parents didn't really talk to me, nor I to them. I was subsequently the one who brought this upon us, with the help of my grandmother, of course. Throughout this entirety, we still heard the creatures scream. They had stopped ripping apart our house after a few hours. Unfortunately, they did surround the metal box, or that's what it seemed like. They were waiting for us to come out of hiding. They would quiet down for a couple of hours, then they would scream and try to lure us out of our metal bunker. Using the voices of people in our lives. One by one, they cycled through people, from my mother's patients to friends and family members until all we heard was what seemed like a crowd of people screaming and bawling their eyes out. They did this every single time. Every. Single. Time. It was wearing my mom out. At one point I and dad had to physically sit on her to get her from pushing the button. Hell let's be honest, it was wearing us out. They knew how to trigger our emotions. 
Only a handful of times did I hear Max's disembodied yelp and screams. It infuriated me, my poor baby didn't deserve this bullshit. Every time I heard that yelp I wanted to push the button and run out to save her, but right before I did, I remembered each time that she was gone. I was going insane, I felt like shit for putting Max into the situation that leads her to her demise. I felt like I had put my family in a death or death situation. My parents wouldn't talk to me if at all. And I was defeated. One what I believed to be a day, everything was going about as our new normal when I started hearing whimpering. A couple of the creatures started to whimper for a while. Then struck absolute chaos. Sirens and gunshots and what sounded like chanting rang through the metal bunker. It was a bittersweet feeling to hear something other than creatures trying to kill us. At one end was it just our minds playing tricks on us, or was it real? My parents heard it too. They actually started talking to me and to each other. Then we made up a game plan. When the gunshots and sirens stop and we hear voices we will hit the button and take the risk of going back into the house. If we die, whatever. If we live, awesome let's move on with our lives. And we took our places around the bunker and waited. It seemed like hours had passed before the gunshots and sirens stopped ringing. That's when we heard two voices calling out our names. Hesitantly my dad hit the button and slowly the mental prison we had been confined to lifted. I could hear the slabs of metal slamming back to their dormant position and light filling up the room like a pleasant ocean. I was the first to walk up and out of the bunker. I walked up the stairs, that's when I saw her. I remembered at that moment if, for any reason that someone couldn't contact me or my parents, they were to call my closest friend Sierra. She was my three and final emergency contact on all my forms. Next to her was the cop on the scene at my accident. I walked up with my hands in the air so I wouldn't get shot and killed by the policeman and my parents followed behind closely. I hugged Sierra before I could notice my parents' house. It was in absolute shambles, a whole wall had been torn off and ripped to pieces, all of the furniture had been turned literally inside out. Holes in the wall, the whole nine yards people who I didn't recognize walked around the house chanting something and the police officer started to speak. I don't remember much of the conversation but I do remember that the hospital called Sierra to notify her that I hadn't made it to one of my appointments and couldn't get a hold of me. She had informed them that she hadn't been able to get a hold of me either, and then she contacted the authorities. She had driven past my parents' property before the authorities had arrived and smelled a stench that was all too recognizable and called a friend who was a part of the Shawnee tribe. Then had called the authorities to tell them to meet her somewhere close by to explain the situation she had just seen and to give her and them time for the Shawnee tribe to arrive. From there that's when they saved us. The officer looked at my parents and started to explain that unfortunately with situations like these, we had to go into a protection plan, kind of like the witness protection plan but different. The indigenous groups of America came up with a protection plan for people who had things like this happen. Which meant me and my parents and Sierra had to uproot our lives and move somewhere completely different. Change our names and social security numbers. And become completely different people. I looked towards my parents and they looked so undeniably defeated but eventually agreed. The officer turned to me and Sierra and asked if I wanted to do the same or risk having my life be taken. I and Sierra agreed. Before I could be whisked into a new life, I asked to go outside and get a breath of fresh air. The officer agreed and I walked out the back door. This time there weren't any weird creatures smiling back at me viciously. I sat down on the grass in my backyard and looked up to the sky and thanked Max for everything she did for me. I thanked my neighbor and her dogs, and all the animals who died in this process. And I apologized to all of them. Then I sat. In pure silence, embracing every twitter from the birds, every day of sunlight that grazed my skin. And breathed. From not far, but distant enough. I heard a tiny whimper. I got up, and despite my mind telling me how stupid can you fucking be you almost died just now. 
stop walking towards it I let my body walk towards the bush that it was coming from. I reached underneath to see what it was and to pull it out when I felt something fluffy. Not really surprised I pulled out the fluffy little creatures from under the bush and I looked at it and smiled. A small dark fox with markings around its ears and eyes like Max's looked up at me. It was malnourished and needed somewhere warm to be, so I took it and walked inside. The cop looked at me and the foxling and ushered us to his vehicle without question. Here I am, on this car ride to the station. All I can hope for is peace and protection. I am going to look after and raise this foxling as best I can until it's time to be released into the wild. Wish me luck.